This is Autoline After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash. Episode 460 for April 18th of 2019. New York Auto Show. Come along for the ride. How's that for an open, Gary? Boy, you're very enthusiastic about this show, and it is not a bad show to be enthusiastic about. It's not a bad show. In fact, Rector wrote in to say he thought maybe there's more reveals taking place here than there was at the Detroit Auto Show. I don't have a hard count for Detroit, but we're going to show you 14 new vehicles that are debuting here for the very first time. So, you know, it's sort of odd that when you think about New York that, I mean, the traffic is just... Horrendous, Horrific. horrendous congestion out there. Why would anybody want to buy a car? But it turns out that in terms of the market area that New York is in, they buy ne- nearly 7% of all the cars that are sold in the United States and over 12% of all the luxury cars. So that's why there's a lot of cars being introduced here. And we're going to show you the gamut. We're going to show you from entry-level cars to the top-end luxury. We're going to show you exotics. We're going to show you some electrics. We're going to show you concept cars as well. So we should get started, and who was it? Mac Murphy wrote in to say, I want to see that Lincoln Corsair. That's where we're going to go right now. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. And we're opening the show with the Lincoln Corsair, which I don't know what you think, Gary, but I think it's probably one of the more important intros at the show. Well, I think you're absolutely right, John. I think that the. Uh this vehicle is key to Lincoln's rebirth in the U.S. market and, and in the Chinese market where this car is also going to be sold and manufactured. Exactly right. In fact, hey, as we go up to the vehicle here, I see David Woodhouse. Here's the, the chief designer on this vehicle. David, good to see you here. Hey, Gary. David, how, how are, are you? you? Good. So why don't you give us a brief walk around on this vehicle? We've got our audience. They're very interested in what you've done with this vehicle. To me, it's sort of like a baby aviator, but you take it from there. Yeah, so uh, Corsair completes a four SUV lineup. And as the smallest one, obviously, it's, it's probably the most expressive and the most, most youthful, deliberately so. Um, so I think, you know, it, obviously, it follows the same consistency of design vision of the, of the other models, but definitely the mo- most expressive, yeah. So, so, okay, you talk about the expression, show us what you find to be an expressive... Yeah, so, I mean, obviously you've got the same signature cues, the signature grille, the full-width taillights, they're, they're consistent. But I think the big, the big thing is the down-the-road impression. So if you look at the side view of this vehicle, it's the fast-falling roofline. You know, that, that, is, that is... And this very acute back angle as well. So those elements, and then obviously the form within it. So if you look at the body side, this is one of the deepest body sides we've ever generated. So, so you're talking about this? Yeah, yeah, it, the, the form and the pressing through the doors. And, you know, th- this, this section is just colossal in dimension. And you can see the life and energy within the form there. You get these beautiful singing S reflections, which, you know, as the car's moving, that's going to draw you in and create attention and be a thing of beauty. Right? So, so some of your competitors have a more, let's say, aggro approach to the exterior design. You guys are not going in that direction at all. Yeah, so five years ago when we set out our new brand vision and design vision, we called it Quiet Flight. And deliberately, we sent out these tenants of beauty, gliding, human, and sanctuary. And the beauty aspect, I always say, is qualified by being elegant. And, yeah, I, you know, I, we don't need to talk about which competitors, but I just say that, you know, there does seem to be an arms race of kind of attack, portraying attack mm-hmm. uh, to other road users. And I, I, I want to be in the business of seduction with Lincoln, <laughs> right? That's a great... Can we... Is this open? Yeah. Let, yeah. Let, let's yeah, get a yeah, camera yeah. inside and... Uh, Why don't you talk about what you've done with the interior of the vehicle? So, you know, fundamentally, uh, it's all about this coast-to-coast linear horizontal breakup. And, you know, this is a bit like theater design, where you've got a very limited space. 
you want to maximize the eye and the read across that space. So we, we, you know, we employ deliberate tools, design tools, uh, to emphasize the width. And this is all about opening up the space around the occupants and exaggerating the full width of the interior. So it feels bigger, wider than actually a, a vehicle in this segment. And it, as you said, you got those long lines on the instrument panel just to take your eye to make it look wider. Absolutely. And, you know, again, those tools that we, we use, you can see on the air registers, the accenting of them. We actually break the volume of the air register in half. So we, we ring and highlight the top half of it so it looks even uh, slimmer. And then any opportunity to go horizontal, as an example, the, the, uh, the transmission sh shifter selector, you know, we call it the piano keys. It's a floating element. And then you've got this beautiful suspended cantilevered element below it. And, you know, at its heart, I would say this is like any great American design. I mean, you know, going back to Frank Lloyd Wright and the best of American architecture, it's all about the horizontal. It's all about, you know, these beautiful cantilevered elements. So, so you're, when we look at the interior, you're not doing a fighter jet cockpit for the driver. This is supposed to be more relaxing and you have the uh, 28 position or... 20. 20, 20. 20. Just 20. 20 positions. Yeah, just, just 20. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Seat for the, the, for the driver to be dialed in and comfortable. So I, I think there is something fundamentally American in this, Gary. You know, the, both the format of the, I, the IP, the instrument panel, but also the comforts and conveniences. I think we're getting back to what is the core of you know, the best of American products, you know, um, uh, you know, modern American. Well, good. Well, David, thanks for your time. Thank really you. always good to run into you and great to get a first-hand view from your eyesight of what this car is all about. You're welcome. Thank you, John. Real good. Thank thanks. you, <clears throat> Okay, we're on to the next one. In fact, we're right next door is Cadillac, and we'll go take a look at the new CT5, but I think this Corsair is pretty good. You know, yeah. I, I've been saying all along that when the Aviator comes out, it's going to be the tipping point for Lincoln. And this Corsair is just like a baby version of the Aviator. So to me, this is a one-two punch for Lincoln. Yeah, I think that uh, having the, well, if you think about it, I mean, they have the Navigator, which is, you know, the size of a uh, small house, right? Right. And, and, and now they're able to go all the way down, so they, you know, they have the Nautilus in there as well. So think about this four-car lineup, the Navigator, the Aviator, the Nautilus, and, and now the Corsair. Um, and, and you know, clearly, as we've talked about on the show a lot, I mean, this, this crossover segment is, is really hot, which, which makes it all the more curious as we walk over here at Cadillac that they're showing a new sedan. Um, so what do you think? I mean, you know, Lincoln's clearly giving up on passenger sedans. Cadillac is not. Can Cadillac make a go of it? Well, if, you, if we think about it, I mean, one of the things that Cadillac is basically doing is that, is that you know, we, we've seen the, the um, ATS has not been doing well. We've seen the CTS has uh, seemingly passed its, its day. And now they have the CT5, which is going to be basically a replacement for two cars. So, you know, does, does one car carry the, the weight of, of two, you know, in, in the market where Cadillac, quite frankly, isn't doing particularly well? Right. What I find interesting is uh, this is five inches shorter than the outgoing CTS, but a lot, an inch longer wheelbase. And they put that extra room into the rear seat leg right. room, which was always a problem on the CTS and the ATS even more so. Right. So I, I, I think it's pretty interesting that, you know, they're trying to sort of bridge the gap, like you're saying, between uh, ATS and CTS. You know, and another thing to think about is, is that, again, when we're talking about Lincoln and Cadillac, China is very important to both of these brands. And so the question of, okay, did they stretch the rear seat leg room because there were complaints? Um, here we have the designer, Brian Smith. Brian, how are you? Good, how are you? Brian, you got a minute to talk here on camera about your car? Sure. So tell us, you know, from a design standpoint, what did you really set out to do with that? Well, everything starts with proportions. So uh, we stretch the wheelbase a little bit. We put the wheels at the corners. And you'll notice that fastback silhouette really to shake things up in the sedan segment. Yeah. And uh, we were talking about... Uh, it's five inches shorter, too, though, right? So you've changed the proportions from that standpoint. 
That's right. We work to sort of right size the car for the segment that it competes in. So the car got a little shorter, um, but it's also wider. So that proportionally, we like that short and wide, um, low roofs, long hoods. Um, this car really, uh, I think, goes sort of a different direction for us. It's very much inspired by the Escala concept car. So uh, you'll notice that in some of the, the, the DLO treatment, particularly in the front end. And I think just how sort of restrained and confident uh, the car is. It doesn't rely on any gimmicks. It's, it's really simple and restrained and, and confident. So, so you'd, you'd worked on the CTS, which, yes. which was arguably more of an expressive, sort of edgier type vehicle. So is, is this, in your estimation, a more mature approach to sedan design? Well, I think this car, uh, we work the persona to go both ways. Like we've got the very um, sporty sport edition that sort of builds upon V-Series and the performance that um, we've established with the Alpha architecture. But you can also take the luxury route. So I think the car needed to have a persona that can, can be built both ways. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we really strove to just make the car extremely handsome, easy to like, and, and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Talk about this uh, little design element at the, the very rear quarter window. It's almost like a little a bit of a teardrop on it. Yeah, it's, you know, it's really there to just uh, shake things up, use the bright element in a different way. Um, it helps elongate the DLO, um, stretching that feature further rearward. It gives the car some motion from that aspect. Sure draws your eye right to it. <laughs> well, there has to be a little controversy for you guys. But it, it, it helps accentuate that fastback look, though, I mean, because it's, it's, yeah, it it's, takes, pull, it's pulling back. Well, it takes it's, thickness and weight out of the C-pillar uh, area. You know, we wanted the, the upper cabin to look light and airy and have more glass than we've you know, been known for in the past. We're offering the customer more visibility and making the body side thinner and leaner uh, so that the wheels look, look uh, bigger and, and, and more masculine right size to the car. And the front end is really establishing the face of Cadillac. We're, you know, we've seen this on the XT6, right? Uh, the, the family resemblance, not exactly the same. Yeah, you'll notice uh, a little more horizontal in some of the elements, still with a very strong vertical signature, but we've, we've worked to sort of um, compress the grill, make it wider, and emphasize the width that this car has over the outgoing model. This car is over an inch wider than the outgoing CTS, so um, really thought we'd emphasize that. You know, let's walk over where we can get a look at the interior, too. There's a car over here that we'll be able to take a look at. And what was your whole approach in terms of designing the interior of the car? Well, I'm not the interior designer. Crystal could answer your okay, questions more you're about that. Okay, but sort of tied in with it, and we've got you on the mic here. You got it, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, it, it, you know, in general, it's it's got a cockpit uh, sort of feeling. It's driver focused, but um, not so much so that the passengers are left out. I think the uh, you get a standard 10 inch infotainment screen now, um, all the way down through the trim walk um, on the center stack. We've continually improved our um, user experience um, infotainment system, the Cadillac user experience, and it's getting better and better, faster, more intuitive and uh, requires you less time to take your eyes off the road. We've also got this um, rotary controller now that is a redundant controller for the touch screen so you can cycle through menus and select things there without actually having to take your eyes off the road and, and move your hand. And what, it's a two liter turbo standard powertrain and uh, is it a 3.3 V6 or? You might know that better than I do. Yeah, it's a two liter turbo four cylinder base and then our up level engine is a three liter twin turbo V6. And what I really like, you're going to put Super Cruise on this car. Yes, yes, and uh, Super Cruise, amazing innovation, uh, very intuitive, works really well. Um, we're really excited to spread that across our whole lineup in 2020. See, so you told me you took a trip, just as, as 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 you, not as you designer guy working for Cadillac, and you really had a good experience with that. Yeah, I, I drove uh, four hours each way over a weekend, and I let the car drive me almost the entire way there and back, and it was amazing. I, you know, you, you still have to maintain eye contact with the road, look forward. There are sensors to let you know if you're taking your eye off the road, but just 
the relaxation of not actually having to steer, take your hands off the wheel. You, you just arrive refreshed and, and without any of that tension in your neck and shoulders. It's really amazing. I did the same thing a year ago in a uh, CT6, and uh, man, you, four hour drive just like you did. I had to intervene a couple of times when the road did some funny things, but it was a great driving experience. Yeah, yeah. Construction zones get, get a little iffy. It'll it'll shut off when the GPS senses it's not you know uh, the normal setup. So you have to keep your eye open for that. But there are uh, redundant warnings. You notice the seat vibrate to let you know uh, it was going to take control. The light flashes. Um, but I thought it was very intuitive, easy to use. And I was uh, I'll be honest. Even though I work at General Motors, I was a skeptic at first because I thought, well, if I if I still have to pay attention to the road, why would I want this? But really, it it, uh, it changed my mind instantly. The first night I drove it home on the freeway and used it, it was a game changer. I thought. What what? You're the designer. Got to ask you this question. What is your favorite feature on the exterior of this car? Uh, I like the face. I like the front end. You know, the original sketch for this car all started with the front end. Um, it was just a um, refreshing change of pace for us, still with all the Cadillac cues and the vertical light signature, but just a different proportion, a different way to render a Cadillac base. Um, you know, the rest of the car is easy to do when you have these great proportions. Mm-hmm. It really is. Hey, thanks for your time, Brian. Really appreciate Brian. it. Thank you. Guys. Thanks. You know, we just sort of like uh, ambush yeah, you yeah. and... Uh, yeah. and- <laughs> Yeah, there you are. And you did a good job. Yeah. Well, thanks. I <laughs> walked right into it. You've, okay. you've talked about this one or two times, I know. Yeah, that's right. All right, good to okay, see you, Brian. Okay, have a great you. rest of show. Thank you. So we're going to have to take a quick commercial break, but what do you think? Cadillac, Lincoln, they on the right track here? I, I think they're on different tracks, mm-hmm. and, and I think that maybe for these two American brands that it may be a good thing for them to be going in different directions because if they were both trying to occupy the same space, I'm afraid that neither of them would do very well. So it comes down to the question, though, is is this going to be a horse race between those two brands? Oh, I think it is. You know, Cadillac's got a big lead on Lincoln right now from a sales standpoint. I think Lincoln's got the better product cadence right now, coming out with all these terrific-looking SUVs in a market that wants SUVs. Cadillac, even though this is a good car, they're just going to have a harder time with it. But, you know, we, we can't overlook the fact that, I mean, they have the X-T4, which is fairly fresh. Um, we're going to be having, what, the X-T6 coming out soon? I think that's right, yeah. And, and so, yeah, so, 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 so they're not, they're not, they're not yeah. uh, taking their eye off that either. But, yeah. you know, again, you get back to this question, does the sedan have a life? And... Um, we're going to see maybe later in the show that perhaps it does. Um, yeah, that, no. that, not all companies have given up on that, but uh, so we'll see. There, we're, we are going to see because there are some pretty interesting sedans here, and we're going to take a look at them. But first, we're going to take a quick commercial break. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. All right, we're back, and what you're looking at right now is the all-new Toyota Highlander. And Gary, I don't know a whole lot about this vehicle. Do you? Well, so I, I think it's interesting to note that if we if we look at the styling of this vehicle, it seems to me very reminiscent of the direction they were taking with the new um, Rav Four, which is the just massively giant-selling compact um, crossover SUV, and, and so. I, I think what they're trying to do is establish this as, as being less brutish in terms of, you know, massive that, as it had been and, you know, in changing it up a little bit to make it a little more uh, friendly to people. You know, so here we have the, you know, the, the midsize, the three-row. This is going to be competing with the likes of the Explorer that will be coming out a little later this year. And, uh, um, you know, they're, they're offering it in um, internal combustion engine. They've got a hybrid version of it. And, uh, you know, I, I think that... Toyota is an interesting company um, because 
they're introducing things like this, but they're also introducing things like a Yaris, which is... Uh, an all-new Yaris hatchback. Yeah, I mean, right. it's a tiny little car, right? right. It's based on the Mazda 2 uh, platform. And so I think what we're going to see here is, is that Honda, or I mean Honda, excuse me, yeah. Toy- Toyota, I mean, full line, I mean, seriously full line in right. terms of what they're bringing to market. Right. I, I'd echo what you were saying, too. To me, this front-end design looks less aggressive, right. less coarse and angry, a little bit more sophisticated. No, don't get me wrong. It's still a pretty aggressive grill, pretty, you know, in-your-face kind of right. grill, but not as much as the outgoing model. And, you know, and, and certainly, I mean, if we have the opportunity to look at yeah. the, the Let's rear, take a look at the rear of this first. vehicle, okay. and, and so, you know, you're seeing this is smoother and sleeker than um, I think it has been in the past, where it's been more um, vertical and, and, and edgier. Let's take a sneak peek at the interior on this, too, because, again, to me, it looks more sophisticated than right. the outgoing model. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the outgoing model, um, it, when, I, when I was first in the outgoing model, I was surprised at, at how trucky it was. I mean, it, it just it was shocking to me. And, and I see this, and I'm saying, wait, you know, they're understanding that the market is not a market that is necessarily going to be you know, driving a Tacoma when they're not driving the Highlander. And I think that they're saying, okay, let's bring the Highlander and bring it up. And yeah. they seem to be doing it. Let's move on over to Honda over here. But, you know, as, as we walk that way, uh, going back to the hybrid, I just saw today <laughs> that the, the hybrid Highlander, 34 miles to the gallon combined, which is like 17% better than the, the outgoing model. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's pretty good. 34 combined on a... On a pretty good size SUV, right? And you know, it's interesting to think about it that we we long thought that basically hybrids would be confined to being small vehicles. And in, in I think that with with this car, certainly um, Toyota is proving that that's not necessarily the case. No, it and, can't and, be. And, and getting that good mileage. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So here we've got Honda's got one of the most interesting different things going on here. Uh, We've got, who, who are we talking to here? You can talk to me. You're going to talk to Chris, okay. you're talk, talk to Chris Martin. If we're, okay. talking about the, if we're talking about the safety. We okay, can. Chris, come on over here so we can. What the heck are you guys doing showing a smashed up car at an auto show? You know, it is the same concept as, as what happens when you see traffic on the freeway after a crash. People want to look at something like this. <laughs> And you know what? We think safety is an important thing for people to know about. And unfortunately, at auto shows, we have a lot of safety displays. They talk about all the wonderful safety technology we have in a car. But not everybody reads those things, right? People are going to look at this, and we know they are. And it's an important thing for them to know. This is our most cost, our, our lowest cost SUV. The crash structure in this, as tested by HS, gets the good rating in all of their crashworthiness. This is the toughest test that they do. This is a driver's side small overlap crash test. It shows how that energy is, is absorbed by the structure in a really, really aggressive test, transmitted around the passenger compartment through the vehicle. Airbags work together with it, protect the passenger, reduce the possibility of injuries. You know, really, ultimately, this type of technology can help save lives. All right, so, Chris, theoretically, I mean, I'm looking at this, and it looks horrendous. Yes. Okay. Are, are you guys suggesting that a person in this vehicle would walk away? You know what? We, or maybe not we're, we're basically looking at the crash test ratings, and the dummy itself has sensors in it to detect the, the severity of injuries that they would suffer. Um, IHS measures deformity of the ring around the door. They do things like that to predict how well an occupant would survive a collision like this. Mm-hmm. And their rating was good for this crash mode. So they are saying in their rating that this vehicle is among the safest that they rate. You know, I'm amazed at this. Uh, I've been asking some of my colleagues, because I walked by here earlier this morning and saw it, and I've been asking my colleagues, has any other automaker shown a crashed car at an auto show? They thought maybe Tesla had done it, but nobody can remember for sure if any automaker has ever shown something like this at an auto show. Well, you know, we've wanted to do something like this for a while, and we wanted the, you know, the, the, the best circumstance in which to do it. Uh, frankly, this car was crash-tested just recently by IHS, so the timing worked out for the New York Auto Show. We called up IHS, said, hey, we'd like to borrow the vehicle that you guys actually crashed. They thought about it for a couple minutes, said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, because their, their mandate is to raise awareness of, cra- of vehicle crash safety, incentivize people to buy safer vehicles, 
we like that as well. We want people to buy safer vehicles. We want them to buy Hondas. Real good. Chris Martin, thanks for your time, man. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Okay, we're going to move on here. Let's go down to Porsche, take a look at the new Speedster. And, uh, you know, Gary, look at this over here. This is kind of interesting. Yeah. I will say this for the New York Auto Show. They tend to get the exotics in here. Yes, they do. We've got Lamborghini. We've got the Briggs Automotive Company. I don't know much of anything no, no. about them, but uh, there sure are a lot of one-off exotics, or I shouldn't say one-off, but a lot of exotics with, uh, you know, very high price tags on them. And Koenigsegg is here as well. And, uh, you know... These kind of brands don't show up at every auto show, so I, I give the New York show kudos for that. Well, most cities don't have Park Avenue. and. <laughs> okay, here we've got the 911 Speedster making its debut at this show. And uh, essentially a 911 with the roof cut off, right. that is what you could say. but And it's a limited edition, and this is uh, part of Porsche's 70th... Um, 70th anniversary, and uh, so they're. It's, it's, it's interesting that they're showing this car, and um, in, in this market, when you would you would think that maybe they would hold back and it would be the Taycan, the forthcoming electric vehicle, would be the one. But I think that they they realize that the 911 is just a classic car that you know everyone would like to own. Well, we caught this car at a lucky break because when I was here earlier, sort of scoping out what we should be talking about on the show. This place was packed. Mm -hmm. You know, all kinds of people just getting in and out of the car. And so uh, I'm glad that there's a little bit of a break in the crowd right now so we can show a better look at it. Okay, let's see. What else? Let's move over here to uh, Subaru because they got something all new as well. And what it is is an all new Outback. You know, Subaru is an interesting company. In as, in as much as, even though they are small, they are continually setting sales records. Month after month after month after month, people are buying Subarus. Um, you know, they. If, if we if we were to look at the size of this stand here, I mean, I, I've got to believe this is one of the largest booths in the Javits Center. It is. I mean, it's, it's one it's, of the more it's, impressive ones. It, for it, sure. It's huge, and, and you think about it. I mean. That, that people in the you know, northeast part of the country are the ones who probably really kick-started the sales of Subaru because of the uh, uh, all-wheel drive that they offer. And so I think that they're really recognizing that and figuring that, yeah, people probably will be coming down from Vermont and in places like that to the New York show. No, you're right. And, uh, you know, let, let's take a closer look at the Outback here. But, you know, getting back to your point on sales, they got to be reaching a decision point whether or not to build another assembly plant in the U.S. because that's what's holding them back right now. Right. They just don't have the manufacturing capacity to sell more vehicles. And uh, But that's a big roll of the dice, you know. Um, if you go build a billion-dollar plant, which is what it's going to cost, you got to know that it's going to be good for years to come and not just be a flash in the pan. All right, so i got a question for you. I look at this vehicle... And people would say, oh, it's an SUV. I would say it's a station wagon. It is a station wagon in my eyes as well. It's, it's interesting how they blend. I mean, clearly when, when the Outback first came out, station wagon all the way. Now it's evolved. It's this interesting, yeah, we, we could argue, wagon or crossover. Right. I, w I would argue, and you would too, yeah, and, wagon. And, but, and, but, but, but the thing that is, is counterintuitive is the fact that, as we all know, no one wants a wagon, right? And, and yet Subaru is setting sales records. I mean, somehow putting cladding down at the sill does not make an SUV in my estimation. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but, uh, and, and I mean, so, so that's basically what we have here. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a stylish vehicle. I, I, I don't think that Subaru is the kind of company that is ever going to win design awards for their exterior styling. You're so very kind and diplomatic. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a fan of their styling whatsoever. I am a fan of their cars, though. Right. You know, the, this latest platform that they've developed, this new architecture, is sensational. It's just so rock solid. Mm -hmm. and, but, yeah, man, if they ever came up with beautiful designs, right. watch out. See, but I wonder if, if this is, I mean, so there, there's a certain quirkiness about Subaru, and, you know, and that's, that seems to be part of their brand you know, you know, that, DNA. Or, no, you're, you're absolutely right. 
people who buy Subarus are not trying to flaunt that they've bought a new car. Right. Of course they want people to notice they've got a new car, but they don't want to flaunt it. And so Subaru's come up with this design that absolutely works for those kinds of customers. Mm -hmm. Speaking of design, we got to walk down the hallway here to Kia, because they've done something kind of interesting with an all-electric autonomous car. Well, you know, Gary, J.P. Fagerback is going to be real happy about this car because he had written in to say he wanted to know about anything electric or plug-in. And here, Kia has got a concept plug-in, or concept battery electric, yeah, I should full, say. Full the Habanero. EV. And here we got <laughs> Kurt Call, right? Hi. Yeah, How you're you exterior doing? designer on this car? Uh, yes, I'm a senior exterior design manager for this, uh -huh. this model, yes. So Habanero right. is the name of it. Yes. Not Habanero, Nero. No, Nero's in there. So well, I mean, it's hinting at something. Hinting yes. at maybe yeah. this could be the next Nero? Uh, it's, there's a possibility. Uh-huh. Yeah. You didn't choose the name by accident. No, no, it was very intentional. So, so what were you trying to accomplish with this compared to the Nero, which I mean is is like breaking new grounds for you guys in terms of I mean, yeah. a small crossover type vehicle. Well, I think we wanted to add a little bit more rugged quality, but still keeping a sleek aerodynamic upper. Uh -huh. So that was the biggest thing, and have this kind of forward attack angle. Um, you can see that in the front how it's chopped off, and the back arrow panel in red that's slanted forward so everything's kind of giving us a forward momentum so just a more crisp more um yeah attack like look i guess so, so this came out of the irvine design studio it did, yeah so inspiration what 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 did you guys say okay we want this we want this we want this i mean in in, in terms of providing it with some character beyond what you're saying in terms of more um off-road-ish yeah i think um from Chris is the uh, exterior designer on this. From his first sketch, and we kept very true to that first sketch, this really strong line that comes through the shoulder and then drops into the rear wheel, and that's really setting up the attitude, the horizontal feeling of the hood. And once again, like I said, this kind of thing looks like it's ready to take off. Mm -hmm. um, and also, with the contrast of the sleek upper, the wraparound gray cladding, which gives this rugged look, skid plates. So... I really like the, the contrast of that, that sleekness and sophistication, crispness, but also the rugged quality, the, the tires, the uh, chunky wheels. Um, yeah, and then obviously the super bright, eye-popping interior, mm -hmm. which is uh, really striking when the butterfly doors open up. So is, is there anything to the design that is predicated on it being a battery electric vehicle? Anything predicate? What do you mean, like the? Like, like, did we were able to do things? Oh yeah, I mean, definitely. You can see how open the interior is. So we really utilize a dedicated EV chassis. You can see how short our front overhang is. So wheels really pushed out, pushed out with flares as well, but also pushed out to the the corners of the car. Um, that's the, the great thing about EV. You don't have to worry about a very large, uh, you know, area to to house the internal combustion engine. So we could free ourselves in that way, too. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got to tell us why you decide on this eye-popping red color, as you say. But, I mean, holy moly, man. Yeah, it's striking, huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it contrasts the exterior, which is a little bit more subdued with the, the crisp white and the gray cladding. But then it's like, you know, it's, it, it's inviting, it's, it's searing, but it's, uh, there's a quality to it that's, like, very tactile. And the floor, what's this with uh, the lights uh, yeah, a, running like through it? Geometric pattern, what I really like is we've got this beautiful uh, triple coat uh, gloss red paint underneath the seat, underneath the console, and you can see the light uh, plays around and, and bounces off in, in new ways. So it's just giving a more pizzazz, more excitement to the interior. And I love the pedestal mount of the, yeah. the two front seats. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we might see? Because, man, does it open up the interior. It does. It's possible. <laughs> there is a possibility. Okay, here's another question. As long as you can still get that movement, um, you know, you don't have to necessarily have two mounts yeah. in the future. That's right. It yeah. just has to meet all the crash standards. And other than that's that, true. you can yeah. get away with anything. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay, you went with butterfly doors. We see that all the time right. on concept cars. They never seem to make it into production. Tesla tried. They had some issues. Could you do something like this, and especially with no B-pillar? You could. Um, cost is always an issue, but... It's possible in the it's future. Possible. Yeah, yeah, sure. Anything's possible with enough money thrown yeah, at it, I go. suppose. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what about the minimal IP that you have in this car? Yeah, so that was kind of a reaction to maybe interiors that have 
black screens floating everywhere, buttons all over the place. It's really this calming environment where everything is projected onto the windscreen through uh, HUD uh, projecting technology. And then you interact with all the functions through this sensory uh, feedback. So as you touch that, it would respond with light to your finger touches, and you could be um, using apps, navigation, radio, whatever, whatever else, uh, you know, media and entertainment. That's pretty wild, and then it just projects up on the windshield. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, now you've seen cars with a variety of different kinds of heads-up display in a small format, just above the driver, but our idea is to exp- expand that across the windshield and even be able to project movie. So That's if you're going level 5 autonomy, you're relaxing, you're in stop-and-go traffic, you're still facing forward, but that windshield, you're not looking out anymore, you're looking at a movie. Or whatever other entertainment. Maybe you're surfing online. And that's the idea. This could be level 5 autonomous, level too. Level 5 autonomy. But also then the steering wheel steering wheel would, would go in for level 5. It would come back to you, to you if you want to drive. Because people still enjoy driving. And the idea is it's like, say you're going to a campsite, you're doing a little light off-roading. This would be the perfect vehicle for that, too. And you can drive along the dirt road. You know, one thing that's interesting on the front-end design is we've seen this minimalist approach a la Tesla with right. no grill whatsoever. Right. We've seen some others come out with what look like regular radiator right. grills. You're creating yeah. something that's not either one of those. Something in between. We still wanted to have a strong presence, but we don't need that big opening. So we did it more with a breakup of material and also showcasing... Um, a new interpretation of our signature grill, which you can see what we've been doing in the past, the double tab. Right. You can still see it here. It's a bit more abstract, but it's this shape and it's that shape. And you almost see it more in negative space in the cladding here. Mm. And then this element is kind of like a, a heat exchanger you'd see in computer equipment, the finned aluminum. So that speaks to the EV technology. Um, your lighting would actually come out of these teeny holes, the laser, high intensity laser lighting. And then here is. Um, Once again, more of an abstract, heartbeat-like approach to our DRL. And that would be animated, and it also can go to a turn signal function, too. I I like these openings that you've got here. They almost look like teeth. They're almost like teeth, yeah, but it's it's to speak of uh, um, EV-style cooling uh, needs. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need a lot of opening, but you need to dissipate some heat, yeah. And you're not using side-view mirrors on this car? No, we've got these little cameras here instead. And do you see that as being something that will be... Our designers are all hoping, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean. I mean, yeah, that's, that's the way it's going. So I think, I think eventually we'll get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I didn't notice that double tab in the grill until yeah. you pointed it out. And, in fact, I've never even heard it referred to as a double tab. That's a first for me. Okay. Yeah, Kia Signature Grill, maybe, instead, is what you've heard? Yeah. Yeah, there's a few different names for it, but... Um, tiger Nose. See, yeah, Tiger Nose, of course, we've used that. Mm-hmm. But um, all talking about the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, but we're all always looking for new ways to do that that type of grill, uh, signature grill. And maybe in this way, it's really utilizing more of the front end rather than just more of an applied uh, grill surround. Mm-hmm. So, so what does this have in common with that Stinger GTS that you keep looking at over there, over our shoulder? What does it have in common? Yeah. I think fun, uh, excitement, um, driving fun still, too, because you can still drive this even though it, it's a future level 5 EV. Um, but yeah, I think it just speaks to the fun of Kia, and uh, of, we have a lot of fun with all of our cars. So we try to make exciting vehicles. So. Is part of the design exercise to come up with a, a new twin tab? It sometimes is. Yeah, we're always exploring new ways to do it. We don't want to just keep um, redoing the same. You know, we want to progress our design. So we come up, come up with something fresh and unique and something eye catching. Real good. Kirk Hall, thanks so much for your yeah, time today, welcome. man. Thanks really so interesting. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate it, man. Good thanks deal. A lot. Okay. We should take a look, quick look at this stinger over here that they've got because this has got a drifting mode. So what was already a pretty hot car, pretty good performance car, they just added that little bit more to it. Yeah, apparently this is a uh, new all-wheel drive system that is being introduced on this vehicle that... Uh, um, it, it does have the capability of shutting it off, and you have a limited slip differential in the back, and uh, it, it allows it to do things that it otherwise would be um, prohibited from doing. Um, this, this, interestingly enough, is going to be limited to 800 cars. Really? Yeah. And uh, okay, so they're making something special out of this. Well, you know, and, and, and an interesting thing is is that when they introduced the Stinger originally and they and they came out with that car, they said that they would be doing lots of 
you know, we just heard the word fun. They'd be doing a lots of fun things with the Stinger going forward. And I think that that's a, a rather interesting approach that they're taking. I mean, we're seeing, you undoubtedly get half a dozen news releases a, a week about companies with new um, light duty truck additions. You know, there's a special this, a special that, a special something else. It's interesting that we suddenly have a car company that's saying, hmm, that's not a bad idea. Let's apply that to, you know, a, a sedan, a sports sedan. Well, real good. We're going to have to take another break right now, and we're going to go to the opposite end of the spectrum here. We're going to come back and look at a couple of luxury brands, but first, a shout-out to our sponsor. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Okay, we're back with AutoLine After Hours. Right now, we're in the Genesis display, and they got a cute little concept car that you got to take a look at here. I think it's all electric, right? Yes, it is. And, you know, the phenomenal thing is is that here we're at uh, the show that you would think that they'd be showing an SUV at. and uh, But they're not. They're not, <laughs> and, and I give them big marks for that. Yeah. Hey, we've got Manfred Fitzgerald. He is the, the head of the Genesis brand, and great to run into you here. Yeah, thank you. You know, it's a um, pretty exciting moment for us of uh, introducing our latest concept car here to uh, the New York Motor Show. So tell us a little bit about it. All electric, right? It's an all electric um, city car. It's it's our answer to the question of you know um, living in big cities where space is a factor, um, and driving an all electric vehicle in style through the city. Um, that's our interpretation of it. So. You mentioned a city car. We're here in New York City where right. the traffic out there is completely horrendous. They're going to be having a congestion charge next year. The traffic is so bad. So I heard, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's surprising that Genesis, a luxury brand, is doing a small car. What's, what's the thinking behind that? The thinking there is uh, we don't define luxury by space. Um, I think you can still have a luxurious experience and feeling... Um, which is not dependent on the physical space. Uh, having a luxurious uh, perception in a, in a very, very confined uh, area, I think that's a challenge, and I believe that we uh, hit it there right on the head. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, let, let's walk back here because there's this panel that's up there that you got to explain this to me. I mean, this caught my eye right away. Instead of a trunk, you got, what, a fender that opens up. Yep. Well, just envision yourself here in New York where everything is pretty cramped up in a parking space, etc. And we thought, why do you have to go behind the car to have access to, uh, to your luggage compartment? So we thought about a lateral access, and that is the solution. That's cool. And the sort of bench seat that you've got here is set at an angle. What's that about? Well, that's um, for convenience purposes. So as you open the door, this bench seat swivels around, so it facilitates uh, the ingress and also the egress of the vehicle. Uh, this is something, obviously, as an electric vehicle, you have so much more to play with in terms of uh, interior space. So you see a flat floor. Uh, that enabled us also to do the bench inside. Um, and that gives you that what I referred to before of having this luxurious spatial experience. So there's a dead pedal in there? Is that what that is? <laughs> so it's not a clutch. Oh, I that's what I was going to say. It's, you have, you have no, an electric that's, vehicle. That's your footrest. Right. That's right. your footrest. On the left-hand side, that's your footrest. And, uh, yeah, we didn't want to have that less prominent than the others. Mm -hmm. So so this call is called Mint. Yes. Is is. is the color um, is, is... There are more meanings to that one. Um, so I was asked that today as well. Yes, uh, obviously due to the color, um, condition, um, there are a lot of, of, let's say, playing on, on more than one meanings is, is, is actually the, the backdrop of that. Okay. So do you see this as being potentially something you would add to the Genesis showroom? Oh, definitely. I will fight to the very last minute to see this into production. <laughs> So that's what we, why we're doing these things. Um, this concept car, albeit that it is a concept car, there's feasibility behind it. Um, and I would say it's about 90% of that what you're seeing here can go into production. 
Manfred, everybody's uh, waiting for the SUVs, which is what everyone seems to be buying these days. When do they start? Um, we will be starting with the sales of the first SUVs uh, in our domestic market in Korea uh, by the end of this year, so in November 2019. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, and something like this could be how far away? Five years out, maybe? Uh, no, I would be pushing the engineers uh, to three to four years out. Oh, no kidding. Oh, I, love so, I love it. So, so when you say the engineers, I mean, are, are we talking here about batteries and things like that? Yes. So, um, so that becomes the uh, that is uh, the, uh, definitely the, the, the bottleneck. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh -huh. So uh, to get there, the right formula together. Um, obviously. We said it's a full electric vehicle, rear wheel uh, vehicle. You don't need an all wheel drive vehicle in the city. Um, uh -huh. So yeah, that is then the task for the engineers to solve. Uh -huh. But the designers did a very nice job on this one. Well, thank you so much. We're very proud of it. Hey, I didn't notice this before. I talked about how the, the seat sort of swivels. Right. So does the whole instrument panel. The whole instrument panel is in sync with the seat. So once you close the door, you can see the movement where this all then comes together again. That is the wildest. I've never seen anybody do anything like that before. Absolutely. So now we we said this is a white spot on the map there, um, where we do feel that we can give our take on how can a uh, city car an electric all electric city car look like. And uh, yeah, it's all about the emotions, which is uh, carried with us. And and so the instrument panel is basically very iPhone like in its um, well, on, format. Well. The, the instrument panel is really reduced to the minimum. It's right. really reduced to the essentials. So what we wanted to have, and coming back to the luxurious experience, is uh, that you don't have a cluttered and overladen um, dashboard with a lot of switches and a lot of buttons to operate. So this reduces it really down to the minimum. So do you see somebody getting this to drive to work during the week and then they get in their G90 or their G80 or G70 Absolutely. Uh, for the I, I weekend to go to the Hamptons? Some, yeah, some of them might have this as their first vehicle, but I see a lot of them having this as their second vehicle. Mm -hmm. Cool. Manfred, thanks for your Thank time, you. man. Thank you so this is a this is really interesting car. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate thanks. Thank you. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Okay. Thanks for stopping thanks. by. Okay. Okay, we're going to go to Mercedes right now, but we're also going to go through the Rivian display because... Dan Albert was asking us to show us what Rivian's got. I don't think we should spend a whole lot of time here because, you know, we did a whole lot of stuff about Rivian at the L.A. show. In fact, we had an interview with R.J. Scaringe. But, Dan Albert, since you asked for it, in fact, you had asked for uh, electric and plug-in stuff, so I'm glad that we were able to show you the Mint. Same with uh, Fagerback, too. Glad that we got that in for you. But Mercedes, very interestingly, has chosen the New York Auto Show for three world premieres. And Gary, what I find so fascinating is, you know, Mercedes has got such a big push into China, and the Shanghai Auto Show is going on right now. I would have expected to see these three vehicles there, not here. Well, it seems to me that uh, Mercedes is undertaking what uh, the Germans call a product offensive, and uh, so... They're not uh, in any way um, stretching themselves too thin in terms of their introductions here or in China. But, you know, you're right that uh, these are vehicles that you would think would be exceptionally well-received. Yeah, so there. they've got the GLC Coupe, and we're looking right now at the, the GLS, their, their big SUV. And... Uh, Let's go down to the other end because everybody or so many of our viewers are so interested in electrics. At the very end is the, the EQC. And uh, we've seen pictures of it, but this is the global debut of the car. And uh, let's see if we can open the door there because I want to point out uh, the video screen. You know, everything these days is, yeah, they locked it. It was open earlier. Carmen, I don't know if you can shoot through the, the driver door window, but look at the screen. You know, it's it's interesting. They've combined both the instrument cluster and uh, really the screen that normally would be sticking out of the console is just one big long one there behind the the steering wheel. You know, it's interesting. This is the edition 1886, and I think that what Mercedes is trying to do is just as the automobile industry started with the combustion engines that, that came out of, uh, of Daimler-Benz that they're starting a new era 
So this edition would be um, representative of that. This is a very, very unusual um, running, running boards, board. At, right. I mean, because this isn't a very high car. Right. So who needs that running board? Nobody does, not for this car. But it gives it a more rugged look, more, you know, for an electric. I'm sure it's purely a design element, not something that's really that functional mm -hmm. that you need to step up into it. The one thing I find interesting is, yeah, here, electric, you know, the whole new future, going into autonomy maybe even. And they're using that 1886, which I guess is going to go back to exactly when Carl Benz started running his first little wagon around in, in Germany. But uh, interesting that they would pick 1886, you know, as something that they're go going to use to, to brand an electric car. Maybe, I guess, to give it a lot more heritage. <laughs> Instant heritage. Instant heritage. But again, you know, just kind of interesting how uh, Mercedes is doing this product offensive at the New York show and, right. and not in China. Well, but then you got to think about it. I mean, uh, the popularity of Mercedes in this whole area, the metro area of New York, is something that it's I'm huge. sure the guys in Stuttgart know yeah. that this, this, is, this is really important to them. And, you know, it's interesting to note that here we are in the Mercedes stand, and there's no BMW stand. Yeah, right. BMW's not at so, the so, so the arch rival. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to take a quick commercial break, but we got one more car to show you, and we'll be back right after this. When we last signed off, I told you we were going to show you one more car. I should have said one more brand because we're actually going to show you two more cars. Take a look at the all-new Hyundai Sonata. In fact, hey, Michael Levinoff, how you doing, man? Good, 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 good to see you. Good, good to see you. Yeah. Hey, Gary. How you doing? Good. Tell Welcome. us. <laughs> all new or is this a all redesign? New, all, all new platform, all new everything, basically. Uh, new standard engine. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of technology packed into this. Uh, I think the design speaks for itself. You know, the proportions. Uh, basically, it's longer, lower, wider. That always makes the car, I think, look better. I think you'd probably agree. Um, so Every we're, designer yeah. would agree with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, big wheels and tires, of course, yep. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're really excited. It comes out um, towards the end of the year, probably October Timing. Okay, so so the obvious thing is is that the last generation Sonata was say softened compared to the model that came out in 2011. It seems that you guys this time have said we're we're going back to where we had been and and what sort of got us on the map. I, I would say that's a safe assumption to make. Yes. yes. <laughs> And I think it's definitely done its job. It's, it's Designers and engineers work together. Usually, you know, they sketch it and clay it first, and then the engineers got to package it and figure out how to make it work. Um, but they actually collaborate, work together. Um, so, like, you know, shock tower mounting points, and there was no compromises made to made to the design, and we're really pleased with how it came out. But even though, as Gary points out, it, it's back to a more expressive design, it's not all this swoopy kind of stuff. It's a hard-edged, straight line. It's not style for the sake of style is, I, is one of the, uh, you know, best ways I think to put it. Um, features like the hidden DRLs that are in the chrome, you know, backlit. Uh, very, you know, unique look. Um, the way the hood goes all the way. There's no cut line uh, in the front. The hood cascades all the way down. Yeah, those, those uh, are those are two points that I mean, we, yeah, we need. Yeah, let's get up to the car look, I've never seen anything that you have this, these these small holes that are emitting so, the light. So, yeah, laser drilled, uh, and I think the, the location and the size varies to get this full effect, and then it kind of just fades away. It just morphs right into the chrome, right, the chrome yeah. goes all the way around the D... Uh... And when they're off, you wouldn't even know they were there. Right. I mean, it's truly hidden lighting. And, and, and to your point, too, you've taken some bright work up through it that hides the cut line of the hood. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So this is always kind of thing for Sonata, been you know kind of a styling element with the chrome here, and then this just took it to the next level for this generation. Right, and so the chrome goes all the way around the DLL. Yeah, so the, I forget what was the it The lasso. The, yes, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, starts here, just kind of goes around, and I think if they could illuminate the whole thing, they probably right. would have done that. But I think that, DOT might have a <laughs> bit of an issue with but that. But I mean, it's, it's well, what the heck? Push the, the envelope. And the finance guys yeah. too. <laughs> I mean, in, in looking yeah. here, I mean, so the hood. Goes all the way to the front. Yeah, there's no shot. There's no clothesline. That's right, which is which is uh, uncharacteristic. Even you know when you have clamshell. Right. Um, they, they still. So that's a perfect that example of the engineers and the designers working together and, and making something like that happen. 
that's always been difficult from a crash standpoint, right? You always had to have some little bit of a lip ahead of it. Yeah, and I'm sure that's all been, you know, calculated in. We're looking for TSP Plus, um, obviously, and so it's, yeah, it's a very unique look to it. So another question that I have to ask you, though, is is that you are showing a sedan, a mid-size sedan. Yeah. Uh, isn't, isn't that supposed to disappear from the We still the like cars. It's I mean, some, like cars. Somebody, some people might be walking away from them, but still forecasted to be over a million units um, this year. Um, so you know, there's advantages, I think, to the CUVs are great, but um, there's advantages to the sedan, you know, the handling, the lower seating position, um, the styling. I don't think very many CUVs right. get proportions and, and styling like this. And so, yeah, we're still definitely supporting the car. Mm-hmm. Okay, but you do have a CUV yes, here. Let's talk yeah. about the venue. Okay, let me change hats. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you have what six or seven SUVs crossovers? So this is, yeah, this is the seven. This is the seven. So this is the seven. This is positioned below Kona. Um, it's about six inches shorter than Kona. Um, the wheelbase is a little bit shorter too, obviously. But I think it's taller. It is taller. Um, so the packaging interior isn't compromised all that much. Uh, it's about three cubic feet less. So you still get, you know, cargo capacity. And it's front-wheel drive only. We're positioning it. We call it, you know, the target buyers the, the urban entrepreneur. So to differentiate between Kona and this, um, powered by a 1.6-liter engine, putting about 121 horsepower. Nice, nimble, small size, but you got capacity, cargo, and utility all wrapped up in a one. So, so this, is, this is essentially a city car city crossover yeah basically yeah when i think city car i think really really small yeah no no, but, no, no. Yeah. but maybe it's not designed to go off-road or, or it, it could probably do some light off-roading inclement weather definitely uh fire trails that uh, kind of thing but the, the but, sonata could do some yeah, light off-roading yeah. too so <laughs> so it is obviously car based it's based on accent um which it shares a lot of its powertrain with and, uh-huh. and some of the other things on the platform so based on everything you're saying, this would almost seem to be the new entry level vehicle for the brand. So this is yeah, this is would be the most accessible, as I like to call it, um, from a price point uh, perspective. And you know, I think you can get we are, are targeting you know a younger buyer, maybe their first time car. Uh, a lot of people are shopping used cars these days. This may be a viable option, um, and then we can get them into the Hyundai family, and then they can decide maybe maybe they want a sedan next, or maybe they want to stay with the CUV. So at least it's a good way to get them into the family. Do you have so, a starting price for this? We do don't yet no as we get closer to launch which will be by the end of the year so let's let's make some guesses under 20 well let's see kona is what 19990 i believe so we can't price it higher than kona it's about the best i can say at this point uh-huh. <laughs> michael but, thanks so much or, or you got another well, question i was there, just going to say that you know we have these two vehicles here we just looked at you know very expressive sonata yes this this seems to be more restrained and in sort of uh you know, the, 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 a single read as, as we would look at it in terms yeah, of design. Yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, cost, you know, factors into a lot of that too as well. But, I mean, it is, at the end of the day, CUV. It's, it's tough to get that kind of volume and proportions right. um, from a traditional CUV. So they wanted to get, you know, the utility in there and just, you know, provide something for that first-time buyer mm-hmm. or somebody looking to downsize. Maybe you're looking to downsize from a larger SUV or move up uh, from something else. So I think it's a wide variety of products we launched today. Yeah, indeed. No it doubt is. about it. And having seven CUVs in the lineup, CUV slash uh, SUV, mm-hmm. you got the bases covered now. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. All, all yeah. the way from the Palisade to this. To this. Yes, yes, definitely. Looking Good deal. To, Michael, yep. thanks so much, man. As really always, appreciate you. your time. Appreciate yeah, it. really thanks do. Thanks, Thank you. Okay. As always. Thank you. Well, good. Well, Gary, I... I know we haven't seen every single vehicle that's here, but we've seen all the new ones that have been just revealed at this show. Mm-hmm. Right. So, your overall reaction, what do you think of the New York Auto Show for 2019? Well, I mean, we, we've just gone to, what, more than half a dozen automakers, all of which are showing new product, and we're looking at product that, that you know, runs the gamut. Yeah. So it, it seems to me that there's a certain vibrancy to this show that um, you might have thought would not necessarily be the case. And not all really expensive cars. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing this car here that, uh, you know, he's saying it's going to be under $19,990 um, all the way to those Mercedes we were looking at. Yeah. So. And who knows where that price is going to be. Well over 100 for that GLS, I'm sure. Yeah. Loaded. Yes. Right. Real good. Well, that's going to wrap up. AutoLine After Hours for this week. We hope you uh, like this different approach. We like to get out of the studio and we took advantage of the show, but thanks all of you for having tuned in and uh, please join us again next week. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, 
propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy-efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.